I have here Dennis and Ray Noble, brothers. Uh, for many years, as a matter of fact, they've been brothers. And uh, uh, Dennis is... <laughs> 76 Oxford. years. 76 years as brothers, yes. And um, Ray is at UCL, and they both have a deep interest in agency and purpose in living things. And um, in fact, they're both really at the vanguard of bringing that issue to the forefront of science. Dennis Noble had a debate a year ago with Richard Dawkins, which went uh, swimmingly well for Richard. I, I don't know if Dawkins would say the same thing, but uh, it was really good. And uh, and you guys also have a band called Oxford Troubadours, which is, uh, I described it to somebody as, it's just pop music from 800 years ago from Southern France, isn't exactly. that? <laughs> yes, exactly. Very it's pop music from 800 years ago. Yes, of course, there are also modern ones doing it in the language, but it's essentially that, that's right. And yes. uh, one of my French friends tells me that the Occitan language is, is actually having a little bit of a resurgence these days. Well, that can't be responsible. Oxford is the center. <laughs> right. You know, there's even a university reading group here with about 20 students doing theses of one kind or another in history, sociology, philosophy, linguistics, who need to read and understand how to understand the text in, in this language. It's absolutely true. I, I form part of it, as a matter of fact, as a kind of honorary speaker of the language. I think it's safe to say, isn't it, Dennis, that actually, um, and, and I, I think this will relate a little bit to what we're going to discuss in relation to evolution, because there's a very interesting thing that's happened. It's almost as if uh, the language has had to skip a generation and yet still right. passed on culturally. And uh, and, we have to skip and, a generation too. Yeah. Yes. And it's largely retained through other co cultural media like yeah. song poetry uh, and so on and and that kept it alive and it's the young generation that are coming back to it that's right yes there's a great hope for the future of biology yes. <laughs> we're not well, lost we, we emphasize in our book the the cultural aspect of trans generation yeah. transmission of uh of information of understanding and uh, I, I don't think that we humans are alone in that. Although no, obviously right. we, we have it par excellence because we have this extraordinary facility of language, which has enabled us to 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 you know pass things on across several generations. I mean, hundreds of years. We we build on the thoughts and ideas of others that existed a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. That's ex that's extraordinary when you think about it. But it's an essential ingredient, I think, of the kind of awakening I see it as, an awakening Earth. And we are the awakening Earth. That doesn't make us, it doesn't make us better than other forms of life. It gives us an extraordinary responsibility, which we also refer to in the book at the very end. Well, Dennis, we, it's what we say at the very end. Let us now um, hope that the new generation will take this forward. And we wish them all well. Absolutely. Those last paragraphs, I, in lectures, I use it always at the end of a lecture now. Because it is that essentially, <laughs> the, the, the emphasis on agency being that we can do things with purpose. That's we can right. have objectives. Uh, uh, and um, it, it's obvious with humanity that we, what can facilitate this is our language and our culture. Um, but th that is also true of other organisms. We see um, agency in organisms, and that's really the, the heart of the book, uh, which instead of treating organisms as passive recipients of the environment, as it were, uh, and controlled by their genes, um, that we become as organisms the controllers of genes and the makers of our environment. This is what we are doing. We are niche creators. All of us organisms are niche creators. 
And, and that's the extraordinary thing, isn't it? Because what it is that we're adapting to is what we're actually making. Uh, and humanity is even more like that because we've created a very complex psychosocial world in which we live and we have to adapt to. And it changes so rapidly. It creates all sorts of problems for us. The rate of change of our lives now, um, I think, is a challenge. And it's no wonder, in my view, it's no wonder that we have such a high percentage of mental illness, for example, of uh, a dysfunctionality, if you like, because things are changing so much. We find it more difficult to place ourselves in space and time. Uh, location was uh, the central importance in history of humanity at one point. We were called by where we lived, you know, John or whatever. Exactly. Uh, or, or what we did within that community, carpenters or whatever, you know, uh, and suddenly we become, I think the word that's used in academic terms is this wretched word, distantiated. <laughs> it's a complicated, complex word, word for something so simple, which is that um, our roots, if you like, are getting getting harder and harder to hold on to. And mm. I think that's a great challenge to humanity. So there's well, already a theme developing yeah. here, which is you have a band called the Oxford Troubadours, which is resurrecting the music of 800 years ago. You are have written this book, which is resurrecting purpose in biology, which was alive and well in the time of the ancient Greeks in the Middle Ages. And really, up until within less than 200 years ago, mm -hmm. everybody, of course, they understood that bio biology was purposeful, but somehow that got eradicated to the great detriment of all kinds of professions, uh, physiology just being one of them. And you're bringing that too. And the pattern is it's skipping generations because there's been a few generations just utterly rejected. In fact, really, your generation and the generation after it rejected mm -hmm. purpose in nature, but mm -hmm. you guys said no. Mm -hmm. So so That's tell right. me, how, how did that come about? I'd like to hear each, each of you I know has your own version of this. Let's start with Ray. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, <laughs> I tell, my yes, it is. We we are different. You see, we're we're brothers, and we've come, we've come, uh, sort of um, after our own independent careers, as it were, in physiology and in biology, to hold such a similar view of life. When we're talking, it's almost as if we're talking as one person, which can be difficult sometimes, as you'll see from this discussion. <laughs> um, but my own. Um, origins uh, uh, in relation to academic life are a bit strange. I mean, I, I left school at 15. I had no qualifications when I left school. And I came to the idea of purposefulness, free from biology in a sense. I wasn't a biologist. In fact, I was interested in things like sociology and politics. I, at one time, I thought I might be a politician. Hmm. <laughs> and um, I would have made a terrible politician because I think too much. Uh, 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 and I don't think that's good when you're when you're needing to make a decision. It's very, very difficult because, you know, you're trapped by the fact you don't know enough. And it was the not knowing enough that led me to be an academic in a sense, because I wanted to absorb more. I wanted to understand more. So for me, academic life was where I wanted to head for. And it was a big struggle for me because I had to recover from having left school. I, do you know they said of me, they could no longer, I'm quoting this, it's from my school report, they can no longer see why public money should be wasted on the attempted education of this boy. <laughs> and so there I was, I, 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 so I left, I, I came out of the school gates for the so-called last time as a student at any rate, as a pupil, I, I left, I came out of those school days wondering what on earth am I going to do with myself? <laughs> but I got interested in, I got interested in politics and my interest in purposefulness, purposefulness and agency came from arguments in politics because I came across ideas that seemed to close society down, rigid forms of society, whether you're hmm. 
as communist. I mean, I have leanings towards socialism. I'm really quite left wing, but I'm not a socialist in the sense I don't want to create a rigid, closed order of society. Uh, and I, I became wary of the idea that is what one should do in politics, where we see where we see problems, we need to have open solutions to them. Uh, you can only create democracies by openness and freedom and so on. So in a curious kind of way, when I eventually got to university to study zoology as a biologist, I was shocked by the fact that the biology at the time was closing purpose down, that it mm. was removing purposefulness from uh, uh, and agency from organisms. That shocked me as a student. Wow. And, and, and I pushed back against my tutors, the, the ones that were pushing this line, I pushed back against them and questioned them and uh, had been doing so ever since and trying to work out what actually is so fundamentally wrong with the gene center view. Where I think it went wrong, my own personal view about where I think it went wrong, but I'm sure Dennis agrees with this, is that from this sort of renaissance onwards, we started viewing organisms as machines and that we could we could better understand them by studying them as physical entities and cogs and wheels and so on of the machinery. But that created a problem for us because we humans are also organisms. And if we are machines, then how do we have agency and purpose? So the ludicrous nature of this wonderful renaissance was that it had to give us something which all the other organisms didn't have, which was a soul that was different a mind that was different, that gave us agency, but denied it to other organisms. And that, unfortunately, I think, persisted. And so when, when we learned about genetics, when you had the major discoveries of genetics and DNA and so on, it was too easy for them to see that as a kind of a ghost in the machine, just like the soul, as it were, controlling the machine from inside. They swarm within us, controlling us. And uh, for me, I think that that's where it, it went fundamentally wrong. The age of reason became unreasonable in the sense of treating us as machines. Reason requires openness. It doesn't require a closed view of life and of humanity. And so how did you feel about this? I was really shocked. I mean, I, as a student, I was shocked by it. I felt... How am I get? I mean, my, my initial reaction was, as I said to her, I actually had some very good tutors because mm -hmm. they they um, responded well to my pushing back. Um, now, this was at a time, this is in the 1970s, when uh, just before Richard Dawkins' book, Selfish Gene, came out, I was being taught the selfish gene. Mm hmm and there were occasions when, for example, I had a discussion with my um, tutor in behavioral ecology on a golf course. We were studying gulls, actually, using, looking at them coming in to and fro from a, uh, a roosting site. But we were on a golf course. And I said to my tutor, I pointed to the golfers and said, why are they playing golf then, Robin? Because he was steeped in this gene centric view. Uh, and um uh, and he said he, he, he used all this game stuff, you know, oh, well, they're really preserving their genes in the gene pool. This is what it's all about, really. And I and, you know, and I say to him, well, you, you mean that we're not doing it because we enjoy it or we're not doing it because we want to have a business discussion. We're not doing it for all sorts of all these things are peripheral to that. And he said, yes, that that's really we have this illusion uh, of of thought, this illusion of purpose. Well, it's such a powerful illusion that I think we really need to know how it is that this illusion can cause things to happen in our system and cause <laughs> things to happen in society, because it does. This is why it came from politics, you see, because it does. We can do things about things. and we see poverty, we can do things to try and alleviate, to try and help people. If we see a shortage of housing, we can decide to build houses. We don't do that because of genes in a gene pool. It's so they've created so they created this mythical world called the gene pool. They it's like a fairy tale, really. I think we say this in the book. It's a bit like a fairy tale. It comes with the gene pool, and it comes with you know this 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 masterful race of genes swarming within us, controlling us, and we're just vehicles 
carrying these genes around. Our conversation now is superfluous to this, really, other than the fact that, you know, you and I are competing with each other in the gene pool, pass our genes on. Well, the crucial thing is not to preserve genes, it is to change them. Evolution needs to occur because it's an adaptive process. So therefore, you want to change the genes, not maintain them. The whole thing is topsy-turvy. But it became this idea that you preserve something, which is the immutable bit, which is the gene. And that's where it went completely wrong. And then you study it in terms of population genetics. So you remove organisms altogether, in a sense. They just become simple, you know, um, items that, that you study in a population sense. And, and of course, that means that in order to study them, you have to have huge samples to get any kind of meaningful answer to the problem and then when you don't get the answer you say well we need a bigger sample <laughs> and you go on studying this uh, we are the gene pool for heaven's sake that's why they need to keep accumulating us in the gene pool this is why they have to keep adding to the samples and making the sample sizes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in order to get the tiniest association between a certain number of genes uh, and functionality because it's tiny there are very few genes that are directly involved in a particular functionality. Our functionality is complex. It's a system. And therefore, it requires... And, and the genes are there as facilitators, if you like. They're there to produce the faculty of our action, the faculty of our behavior, not our actual behavior. When I'm moving my arm, there's a faculty which enables the muscles to move in particular kinds of ways, the wonderful ana anatomical arrangement of the muscles around the joints, which allows when I move my fingers, I can do all sorts of things with them because of the arrangement of the anatomy and the, uh, the muscles and the skeleton. It's beautiful. It's actually wonderful. But whilst the genes are involved in creating and maintaining this, they are not involved in the instance of my doing things with my fingers, as I'm doing now. There are no genes involved in what I'm saying, what I'm doing with my fingers. No gene intercedes on that at all. I, I said the, uh, a little while ago at, a, at, a, at another meeting, I said that I don't know what it is that controls Richard Dawkins, but it isn't his genes. <laughs> Dennis, I'm talking too much. <laughs> well, I, I'm enjoying this immensely. I see. do this. I do this, unfortunately. But because my experience is rather different because I, I went through the standard academic course of you know, being what in England we call a sixth former, that's getting the, the grades necessary to go to university, went, of course, straight away rather than having a gap, as Ray did, um, to go to university. But what triggered this all for me was around 1953, when I must have been only about 16, I was in a class um, being taught by a very good biology teacher at my school in London. And we were being taught from a textbook that had been written almost immediately after Julian Huxley's uh, book, The Modern Synthesis, in 1942. The book, Animal Biology, which was our textbook, was published in 1944. And in 1953, we were still using it. It was a, an extremely popular account for school boys and, and girls, obviously, um, of um, evolution and biology generally. And our biology teacher pointed out to us the reason why Lamarck was wrong in thinking that we could pass acquired characteristics down the germline to the progeny. But then on that, I, I remember asking him, well, how do you know that? And of course, the teacher came up, not surprisingly, with the story that Weissman did, which is to cut tails off young mice as they are born, and then follow the generations to see how many generations it took for the mice not to have tails naturally, just born that way. Of course, it never happened. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the, the fact is, as we now know, 
um, in retrospect, Lamarck never said that. He yeah. was interested in the inheritance of functionality, not surgical mutilation. However, that was answered by the biology teacher, the experiment that Weissman did to dismiss Lamarck. And, and of course, the schoolboys, we all joined in with the laughter at denigrating Lamarck. I'm ashamed of that laughter now. Mm. After discovering what Lamarck did, and what also happened in that class was he took us back a few pages in Grover Newell's Animal Biology to point out that the problem with Lamarck, the big problem, was he thought that animals were conscious and had intention and purpose. Oh, wow. Now, I had to ask myself, well, wait a minute, Mr. Inwood, that was the name of the biology teacher, doesn't the mouse fleeing from a cat in our house have purpose? And doesn't the cat have a very clear purpose to catch the mouse? And I just felt too small to even ask that question. But I came across it again when becoming a student at University College London in 1955 through to 1958 when I did my first degree. And the question that came up with talking with other students who were very much more advanced in terms of what they knew than I was. I was essentially a school student without textbooks. We, we couldn't afford to buy textbooks. So I went to University College London and <laughs> finding suddenly that we were presented with huge textbooks, 1,500 pages, Gray's Anatomy, another 1,500 pages, The Physiology uh, of of humans, and it was shocking. But the other thing that I did was through contact with other students at UCL studying other subjects, I actually gate crashed the seminars for the philosophers. So I became a kind of add on to the philosophy class of Stuart Hampshire, a very famous philosopher, eventually moved to Oxford. And what he wrote was a book on thought and action. Now, that was okay. I learned that it was much to know, but didn't depend on just doing an experiment. You had also to think about the concepts before you did the experiment. But the other thing that I learned was this. I thought I was just a gate crasher. Stuart Hampshire thought this boy is clearly a student. So we will ask him to give a paper at the next meeting, just as we like ask all the other. And of course, I had no, no formal training in philosophy. So I, I tried a tin pot idea on why organisms have freedom. And of course, it was rubbish, really. And, and, and Stuart Hampshire was very dismissive of it. After the end, 10 minutes of my paper, he said, Mr. Noble, you need to read Spinoza. Mm. Was he right? Spinoza was the great enemy of Descartes' idea, which is that organisms are mathematically determined from what is in the sperm and the egg. It is, of course, a version 300 years earlier of the central dogma of molecular biology, which has been the disaster that has infected biology ever since. So I, I was amazed by this. I went out and bought Spinoza's books. And from there on, of course, the rest of the story is obvious. I came slowly, very slowly, to work out how could one reconcile this big debate in philosophy with the issues in biology. And initially, not easy, because it's taken around 20 years of unraveling the molecular biological basis of the central dogma and the basis that the neo-Darwinists took for saying that it fully supported their cause to show that it did exactly the reverse. And that is the problem for people like Richard Dawkins. 
When I explain the mechanisms by which we now know that the central dogma does not exclude organisms being able to change their genes, it does not exclude the inheritance of acquired characteristics, he really had no answers other than to repeat the mantras that he usually uses. So I think we're in the cusp of a very major development here. It is to show that what formed the basis all the way from the 1950s to now, so over a period of over 70 years, has really to be undone. It has to be revised, fundamentally root and branch. There can't be compromises about it. So when you talk to students, I've, I've heard a lecture you give where you talk about, you know, somebody gets convicted of murder. We blame it on the guy's genes. And you, you give this talk to roomfuls of students. Can you explain that metaphor and the kind of questions and reactions that you get from it? Students, I think, again, we're coming back to the jumping a generation issue. Students are extremely receptive to this. Unraveling the mistakes of gene centrism gets captured like an enlightenment by students. The more I lecture to students, I've been doing two or three lectures this week already to student groups from all over the world, because Oxford tends to receive a large number of what these are summer schools for students. I get asked to give talks to these people and they're just extremely receptive. Just an example, a lecture I gave last week to a group of 40, I had a pile of understanding living systems on the table. They all went. Every one of those students wanted that book. And that was just after having explained the central points of the book. So I think the answer is a generation shift is needed and it's happening. So the encouraging thing is that every time you get an opportunity to talk to the younger generation, they lap it up. Anyway, they also feel, for obvious reasons, there's something wrong with what humanity has been do doing to the earth and our environment. You know, there is a sense in which all of this relates to the ecological reasons for which we're in such a mess. And so, in many ways, it resonates. That's what I find time after time. I never find people uh, coming up with objections. That's the other extraordinary thing. You know, they have 40 or 50 of them, and none of them has a, a, a really difficult question to put to me. So I think we are on the cusp of, of a change. We have to see how far this goes. It's an interesting thing too, though, isn't it, that um, some of that change in thought is occurring Oddly enough, within genomics itself, because I think uh, absolutely one, because I think it's there, there's a realization that the real answer doesn't lie there, because all they can do is to go on associating groups yeah. of gene expression with particular proteins or particular diseases or whatever, and with the tiniest associations. And um that creates all sorts of problems and biomedical sense, it creates all sorts of ethical problems because well, when do you use this information? Instead of getting, you see, that there's this group of genes that control this and this group of genes control that, what they find in genomics is that genes, a group of genes can be involved in all sorts of different functionalities. And so it's not specific so this idea, this 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 magic wand idea that somehow or other there was going to be personalized medicine from understanding each individual genome, that each of us could actually have unraveled what our risks are. But the problem with that is, yes, you can see certain associations which give you certain risks, chance of throwing two sixes in with, with two die, for example. Yes, you can do that. You can do that with genes. But when do you actually act on the information that you've got? It creates all sorts of problems. 
in in a biomedical sense. So there's there's some. I think that, that there's a wall that they've they've come up against, which is that they're not finding the direct relation to functionality. That's one thing. The second thing is, I think that the new generation of students, even within genomics, are more questioning of the central idea. Because within biology itself, there's so much that has been happening in the last 30 years to show how it is possible for characteristics in one generation to pass across to the germline. And it happens in se at several stages within the biological process. It happens, for example, in the fertilization, yes, of the egg, but it also happens in terms of the environment in which the embryo is developing. And for organisms like us, that, of course, means the development within the, the womb. And okay. what matters there is what's happening to the placenta as an interface between the maternal system and the fetus. And what they've been able to show is that the maternal system feeds, I, you know, I'm not sure whether information is the right word for it, but feeds certain factors to the feet, to the developing fetus about the environment nutritionally in which they're going to live when they're born. And this alters the metabolic trajectory of, of the organism. Now, that has been shown to be epigenetically controlled. Now, the gene-centric view was to simply say, ah, oh, yes, but this can't be this can't persist. It, yes, yes, of course it does get transmitted epigenetically, yes, but it it does it only lasts for a few generations. But you see, they were saying this without any hard evidence. How many generations? How many generations would it be possible to suggest that it's going to last for another set of generations and another set of generations? No, because nobody was doing any work on it. But people have been now doing work and they're being showing, even in humans, they've been showing fundamental changes transgenerationally in the function of the liver, for example, in relation to maternal metabolism. But it's also been shown that the um, male metabolism also influences the developing fetus, the developing organism. So I think that in, there are more and more students of biology are understanding ways in which there can be transgenerational transmission of yeah. information, of functionality. And the, the idea that there's a barrier to it just simply cannot hold, does not hold, and was never, ever tested. Well, it never tested. There's no there. empirical right. evidence. That's the remarkable thing. In fact, um, Weissman even wrote in arguments with Herbert Spencer, the great philosopher in the 19th century. This is all about 1880, of course, just after Darwin's death. He even wrote that it was a necessary characteristic. Now, no scientist should ever say something is necessarily true. That is true only of logic. He was making a deep philosophical mistake, mm -hmm. actually in attacking Herbert Spencer, who was himself a philosopher. And what Weissman did was to say, well, you're just a philosopher. I'm a scientist. And I know this is necessarily true. Necessarily true? Without any evidence that it actually occurs. Never produce that. Now I come to another point because Ray's emphasized this answer, which is very usual. Well, epigenetic inheritance only goes on for a generation or two. No, if the environment stays changed, it continues because the environment will be continually stimulating that epigenetic change. And after a number of generations, that if it persists, that will get assimilated into the genome. Technical reasons for that, we don't need to go into those probably. Now, that means that it's very clever, you see, from an evolutionary perspective, if the environment only changes temporarily, you don't want it hardwired into the genome. That's a disaster. You've then got to change it back. 
How many generations are you going to take to do that? You may never change it back, just as we may not change back genetic manipulation that we might do in the germline, which is a reason we should be very cautious about doing it. But to come back to the major feature of this, which is such a big evolutionary advantage, it's an advantage for epigenetic changes to be temporary, because if the environment is only a temporary change, you can forget about it. If the environment is long lasting, it can get assimilated in the genome and you've got speciation. Mm. That's the extraordinary thing. Natural selection is not the origin of speciation. It's epigenetics followed by the genetic changes. The epigenetic leads, and therefore the environment leads. Well, this is a very hopeful way of looking at the world because it means that you can change the course of history for your offspring based on your exercise and your diet and whether you're drinking or not and what kind of habits you're cultivating and what kind of environment you're you're creating. I, I've recently become friends with an Israeli scientist named Oded Rachevi, and he studies- oh, Fantastic Skel scientist, yes. He studies yeah. Skelligan's worms, and he says that right. there is a neuron in a C. elegans that responds to temperature. And if you take a normal temperature worm and you put it in high temperature, that neuron will generate an RNA that goes to the reproductive cells and makes a change and makes the next generation adapted to a high temperature. Absolutely. And temperature can be a major factor in determining the proportion of males and females within a population. You know, the, the extraordinary ways in which the interaction between environment. Well, I think one of the other mistakes that have been made in biology of the 20th century was to treat organisms as if they existed within an environment. And the environment was sort of some nebulous box, as it were. And you could study the organism by taking it out and you study it in isolation. It's the beginning of reductionism in a sense because you've already reduced it, because you've yep. taken it away from the environment. But the, 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 the organism has an intimate relationship with the environment. It's feeding both to the environment and from the environment, to the environment, from the environment. What is that environment? That environment, in large part, is other organisms. Other organisms of the same species, but other organisms of different species. And it's in a continuous bubble of change, like a cauldron of change. So the big question for life is, how do you maintain yourself in this cauldron of change? You cannot do it by standing still. <laughs> you have to have, you have to respond to it. So it's not surprising, therefore, that you find that, you know, organisms have mechanisms for responding to those changes. And again, going back to what we said at the beginning of our discussion, and that that also occurs transgenerationally. Transgeneration is the most fundamental way of changing. I go back to that point that reproduction is not to produce the same. It's not about producing another Perry or another mm. Ray or another Dennis. It's actually to produce another organism that is adapting and adaptable. And part of that process is it's physiological. Evolution is physiology. Physiology is evolution. Absolutely. I'm editing an issue of the Journal of Physiology on precisely the title, The Physiology of Evolution. Physiology leads the evolutionary process. That's through the epigenetics, of course. And Ray, couldn't you also say evolution is gynecology and gynecology is evolution? Absolutely. What happened to percent? You know, and this is when, one of the ways I got into this. You know, I was a graduate tutor in obstetrics and gynaecology and in women's health at University College London. And the way I got really fully involved in this, in, in this idea of the, the, the challenge to a barrier to um, uh, acquired characteristics being inherited was the study of the fetus uh, and, and the neonate. 
Now, there's a, a fascinating thing about the fetus and neonate, which is that they are both adapted and adaptable to peculiar environmental pressures. The first in the womb, the fetus, is adapted to life within the womb, but it has at the same time to be adaptable to the life in which is going to lead outside the womb. So it's having to receive information and adapt to it before it comes into the world. But then there are an enormous amount of information that it requires from the world into which it's born to develop this, for one thing, this extraordinary brain. You know, it takes 20 odd years or so after birth to develop this thing that we call our brain, this thinking thing. And it's because it has to interact with the environment in order to develop the extraordinary acuity of our vision, of our senses in general, but also our our, our, our faculties of, of language and so on have to be learned. They're transgenerational in the cultural sense. All this, behind you are these books, the most extraordinary example of transgenerational um, transmission of information. It's extraordinary. I want to reach out and pick one off it and sort of say, what is he reading now? Because it's fascinating. What have we done? Why do we ignore this? Why do biologists, why could biology for 100 years, as it were, ignore this? 20th century would regard all that as an illusion. It's the most extraordinary illusion that we can do that. But no, you're absolutely right. I mean, reproduction, I think, is an essential part of adaptability. We say in the book, actually, that trees, for example, if you look at a forest, a forest actually moves um, and, and trees move. But one of the things that they do is utilize other organisms to move them to move them because reproduction is a way in which they plant transplant themselves further away from their site of of of, of their rooted site because they don't they don't get up and walk away we get up and walk around or we fly around or whatever other organisms do migration is an essential part of adaptability is an, an essential part of dealing with the fact that the environment changes, it has seasons and so on. So it's part of the adaptability. And that's true of rooted organisms as well. Now, they can't move, but one of the crucial things that enables them to move is reproduction. That's one of the crucial reasons why they reproduce. I mean, a tree can last for hundreds of years, but it still reproduces and it reproduces in order to move. So I think we've got all this wrong about what reproduction is for. <laughs> you know, to, 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 to Richard Dawkins thinks it's because it's to maintain genes in a gene pool, but it isn't. It's to move. It's to respond, if you like. It's to change. So I uh, think it's... the only way a tree can do that is by reproducing. I think it's so interesting that Dennis is a physiologist and he says evolution is physiology, and you're a gynecologist and you think evolution is gynecology. I've given talks at science conferences where I said every theory of evolution is a theory of engineering because I'm an engineer and, and they're all true. And so what, what you've done here is you've synthesized not really two fields, but really there's dozens of fields. There's systems biology, there's zoology, there's genetics, there's physiology, there's um, there's stuff about exercise and fitness and diet. Um, it's a very compact book, very easy to read, not easy to write. I, I, the minute I read this, I was like, this was not easy to write. But it's it, it's it's a it's a holistic, yeah, multidisciplinary approach to yeah exactly what the title says: understanding living systems. That yeah. Um, I think you, you you probably debated about the title for three weeks. Well, more than three weeks. But it took years before we came up with that title. In fact, we were then given that title, I think, because <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, I think initially we thought uh, understanding purpose. Uh, now, that, that, of course, I think probably would have been treated as, as perhaps a philosophical book. And yes. it's more than that. I mean, it is no. philosophy. It's a fundamental yeah. book on philosophy, the philosophy of science, uh, philosophy of biology, uh, but it is also about science and what has gone wrong with a particular aspect of science, um, which is this gene centricity in relation to biological systems. So it, it's getting a, a, you're absolutely right, it's really producing a holistic view 
of our behavior and our physiology and our functionality even to the point of you know of saying one of the things that the beha- where we say this in the book that one of the problems of the behaviorists from back in the 1960s and so on was that to some extent they unrooted organisms from their environment and put them into boxes and tested how they behaved under these extraordinary artificial circumstances now you you cannot understand intelligence by doing that because intelligence is how we respond to the niche that we're involved in and creating and responding to Uh, and you know when you stand back i think increasingly people are aware of just how extraordinarily intelligent in the moment organisms are the decision-making process, even of the tiniest organisms. Yes, it's simple at the simple level. They're making very simple choices, perhaps. And you can probably find chemical gradients and things that are determining what their choices might be. But you take a rook, you know, and you watch their behavior. They're solving problems in the instance. That problem isn't in the genes because the genes didn't know the problem would exist. So uh, birds, for example, building a nest. Yes, a lot of it is, as it were, hardwired. There is a a kind of a hardwired bit of the behavior. Otherwise, where do you start? We don't all get born with a blank sheet on which we start writing ourselves and say, I am Ray Noble and I am going to behave like this. No, we start with something. But what we've also got is this extraordinary faculty to cope with change and address problems and solve problems and all organisms have it to varying degrees some kinds of organisms have it at what we would identify associative level if you like that we're able to abstract the world before we make decisions now we don't know to what extent that occurs in uh, many other organisms. There are certain organisms we will never know, but there are some organisms that we do know it occurs. We know it occurs in chimpanzees and monkeys and rats and so on. We can see it. We can study it. Uh, and we can see that they are, to a large extent, uh, abstracting the problem in some form or another. The fact that we have this extraordinary broad facility for associative learning does not put us apart so much as give us this extra faculty uh, of language and so on that enables us to do this. I can't believe, you see, I think that whales, when they're talking to each other, singing to each other, whales will sing to to each other across hundreds of miles of space, of of water, and um, they sing. And when they sing, they're creating all the time. It's not written in their genes. What they're singing is not written in their genes. What they're singing is created in the moment. And it's repeated by other members of the pod. And they will elaborate it. It's a bit like our ancient, uh, our medieval poetry, Dennis. Yes. <laughs> Wales and medieval poets. They're, 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 they're doing Absolutely. some meaningful... Oh. I don't know what it is because we can't translate that. And I don't mean it's translatable in terms of language as we know it, but it's it's translated in terms of significance for the behavior of the pod. And that's the crucial thing. That's right. And birds do the same. And they're continually developing new forms of the language they use. Absolutely right. I I think um, that a strength of the book is so many examples of this are given. It's it's like a natural history book in some ways, because we really do describe how the wood mouse does this, how the fox does that, and how various organisms, you'll find multiple examples of that in the book. So it's, it's rich in terms of drawing on the actual biology and the field biology in particular. And that's what's been neglected, of course, in the gene-centric view. Uh, In effect, the early stages of the development of gene-centrism was to attack those who were concerned with the biology of interactions in groups. The concept of group selection got dismissed in the end 
as though it wouldn't exist, but you, you can see it in practice. Packs of wolves, packs of foxes, groups of birds, they all act in synchrony with each other in order to achieve the objectives of the group. There cannot be any doubt about that. And example after example is in the book. It's very short, but it's, it's full of examples. No, I was going to say, we also challenge in the book the very concept of selfishness itself. I mean, exactly. The, the exactly. Great, I think the great tragedy was that this concept of the selfish gene um, took hold, and it took hold in a, in, in a culturally embedded way. Uh, now, and of course, you had this, we, we, we refer to it as the slipperiness of the gene in the book. Because even defining a gene is slippery. Mm -hmm. People mean different things depending on the context of, about which they're talking when they're talking about what a gene is. And it certainly changed from the original concept of a gene for a particular functionality. Gene to trait um, uh, was almost like saying that a trait is a gene. Now, Richard Dawkins even now does that. He will he will accept anything as a gene that is transmitted. And this is this is the slippery nature of it. When it's pointed out to him, you see that there's more inherited than the genes. He will say, "Well, that's an honorary gene," as if that solved the problem. <laughs> so the, the the concept of selfish. Now, what we say in the book is that you 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 first of all you cannot be selfish unless you've got the choice not to be. So therefore, even the concept of selfishness implies that there is purposefulness in behavior and choice and agency, because without agency, there cannot be any concept of, of selfishness at all. So it's it's a, it's a complete um, misuse of the term. Now, I think the tragedy was that people thought, well, it's only a metaphor. But then was it? It hasn't it hasn't been embedded culturally as a metaphor. We in culturally we say it's in his genes, it's in his DNA, it's in their DNA that they behave like this, it's in their DNA, it's in this DNA. We even do it in terms of machinery now. We say it's in the DNA of our computer that it, the DNA, the DNA doesn't even the, the computer doesn't even have any DNA, but it's in the language is still used in relation to it. Now, what do you mean? Because what they're really saying is it's innate. But of course it's innate, everything's innate. My liver's innate. My kidney's innate. It doesn't work very well, incidentally, in my kidneys. They, they function very badly. Yes, they're innate. They're in me. But that's about as much as one can say about their innateness. It doesn't. And I think that the, well, there's another tragedy, I think. It goes back before Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene. It goes back, as Dennis pointed out earlier, to the misconception about the relationship between genes and proteins and the idea that it, that causality can only go in one direction, from gene to protein to functionality, and that it cannot go back the other way. Which And that is the crucial thing that denies agency to the organism. And that was Watson and Crick. Yeah, absolutely. And it was actually one of the first discoveries that the Human Genome Project made in the Nature paper of 2001, but this is not true, because that paper in 2001 in Nature, first announcing the full sequencing of a human genome, compared that genome to the genomes of flies, worms, and various other animals, all the way through to the human. And it found something extremely interesting that certain proteins had evolved by an almost Lego-like recombination of components that had already been tested and tried to make a new, very interesting Lego-like object, which is a new protein that can do much more than the previous one did. There is absolutely no way that could happen by chance. It has to be the intervention of organisms in enabling that to occur. Now, there's vast amounts to be discovered about the physiology of how that may have happened. That's open to investigation. But what is not is that it happened. That is very clear, even from the earliest 
genome sequencing work. And I've never found a neo-Darwinist answering that problem. How did that happen? Richard just bypassed it when I raised it in the debate with him last year. He, he didn't even take it up. And yet it was one of the most important things that I said. Incidentally, just to give acknowledgement here, that was first pointed out to me very soon after the first uh, sequencing by James Shapiro in Chicago, the in the introducer of the idea of natural genetic engineering, because he spotted it immediately. I wouldn't have spotted it. He did. So I'd like to land the plane with a question for both of you. And uh, Dennis, you and I had a conversation once, and I uh, we talked about how when you retired from physiology, you went full on into evolutionary biology where they weren't exactly inviting you or asking you to show up and you decided to show up anyway. And <laughs> most, most people at that stage in their career are going to write a memoir or some uh, summarizing piece uh, about their life and right off into the sunset. But you went on and took on a whole new profession and you are reforming the pr profession and it's working. And I asked you something like, well, most people wouldn't have the energy to do that. Most people would have been worn down just from the effort of keeping the physiology lab going. And, and what was it that drove you? And part of your answer was music. Yes, that's correct. There is, first of all, if you want to age well, do something. It can be dancing, it can be music, it can be all sorts, swimming, whatever, but do something. That's the first bit of advice to those who want to make sure that they stay um, on top, if that's the right way to put it. But music formed a different um, aspect of my thinking here. I was searching for a metaphor to oppose the selfish gene. And my one was, well, the genome is a little bit, of course, it's only a little bit like the notes in that score. But that is not the music. The music is what the orchestra plays. And just listen to different orchestras playing the same score. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. utterly different. Yes. And, and of course, the musicologists know this only too well. And and how it has even evolved. So that's the other interesting thing. It's an evolutionary process without a Beethoven, which was a great big mutation of enormous proportion in music. We wouldn't be where we are today with the way music has developed. So that's how I started to use in the little book, The Music of Life, a way of exploring that metaphor all the way through 10 chapters to come to a different view. And again, the interesting thing, that, that was published, well, it's close to 20 years ago, no, not quite. But again, there's been no answer to that. You see, Perry, time and time again, in what Ray and I have done over the last few years, we published, we had a bit of resistance at the beginning. There's no doubt about that. We even had a, an attempt to try and stop a meeting at the Royal Society. But let's put all of that to one side. Generally speaking, the answer has been zero. Mm -hmm. No response, no attempt. I wrote an article just two years ago outlining the four illusions, as I called them, of mm -hmm. the modern census, including the central dogma, the Weissman barrier, the self-replication of genomes, and nobody's answered it. Mm -hmm. There's something funny going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm. These are very serious issues. They cost a fortune, incidentally, in yes. terms of health care. Why are we not dealing with the multifactorial mm. diseases that are not susceptible to genetic explanations? It, because we're fixated on there being a genetic explanation. There mm. ain't one. And we mm. better get over it. If you want to cure Alzheimer, if you want to cure uh, diabetes, if you want to cure cancer, you're going down the wrong path just by 
hoping that some genetic cure will happen in the future. It won't. Mm -hmm. And it won't do so because of the multifactorial nature of all those diseases. So this is not just an academic argument between no. people like me and Ray um, trying to reform biology. It's serious. Yes. It's, I mean, what we hope with it's, the... It's, it's fun. It goes back to... to, to this. Sorry, Dennis. It goes back to the, what yeah. we were saying right at the very beginning. In, and how I came myself uh, to the view about agency and so on through an interest in, in political philosophy and politics. Indeed, yeah. So it is politics. The genome, genome mimic funding is politics. When they announced the genome discovery, it was announced by politicians. Yeah, that's right. The, you know, this is the tragedy in a sense. We there's not a there's not a fair that's the word, fair playing field in terms of funding. You see, once you have a paradigm, if, if you're a paradigm thinker, I don't, you know, we don't have arguments about whether science moves forward through a paradigm view uh, approach or or whether it's, you know, looking at creating hypotheses and testing them. In general, science, I think most scientists see it as being a paradigm shift approach to how science evolves and changes. And once that a paradigm has gained hold in the way the gene centric view gained hold, it fundamentally distorts the funding of science because it's seeking answers, top-down directed answers, uh, with a belief that the answer lies in a particular kind of way. So scientists cannot break into their careers without becoming part of the dogma, without being part of the paradigm. And this is why it's taken so long for there to be a paradigm shift. Because once you've embedded it, billions of dollars, I'm going to use the word dollars, billions right. of dollars have yeah. gone into the genomics uh, approach, billions of it. Now, I wouldn't say that everything is wasted because an awful lot of understanding has come out of that. But it's been at the expense of funding for systems biology, of exactly. trying to seek understanding of how systems work as systems and how systems can engineer things how systems do engineer things, because that's what they're designed to do, as it were. That's exactly what we're doing while we're talking here now. But, you know, it's very difficult for people's careers. And you go back, you see, why is it that Dennis had to wait until he retired before he started expressing his concern about the gene-centric view? It is precisely, Perry, because he had to be aware, aware of the fact that people depended on him getting funding. Uh, for research. It's true in my own career. I tried in several areas of my own work to shift paradigms in thinking, both in terms of the functioning of the fetus and neonate, for example. Uh, we came up with the idea that there was a particular inhibitory process that controlled breathing in the newborn and uh, the, the, that might also be related to things like cot death, but it was extremely difficult to get funding for it. Why? Because it was a systems approach. It wasn't looking for a gene <laughs> that controlled breathing. So, you know, and it, this is the tragedy. So you can only really speak out when you've retired. Now, that isn't how academic ac academics should work. Academics should be encouraged to challenge the existing paradigm or paradigms, but in relation to the gene centricity, it was the overwhelming paradigm. You, 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 you couldn't work without somehow or other fitting yourself into it in some kind of way. The interesting thing is that Dennis, you see, did work on genes. Yeah. Uh, they found genes that were involved in um, the generation of the rhythm of the heart. But there was an interesting thing that we refer to in the book, which is, Dennis, you say it, because I think it's the most powerful. <laughs> well, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because yes, the, the, the rhythm of the heart and its process in the heart cells depends on having created the proteins necessary from the genome. But the rhythm of the heart is about one beat per second, give or take a little bit. Um, and there isn't time for gene expression to change during that period. Gene expression changes take tens of minutes, hours, days. And so there's no way. I mean, that process floats free, beautifully free of the genes. You can even knock out 
a key gene or its protein, it doesn't matter which you do, and what you find is instead of a huge change of frequency, this is a very gradual change of frequency, very minor too, 10 or 15%. That, of course, got me interested over 30 years ago in the fact that one reason for these low association scores in genomics is precisely because the physiological mechanisms are beautifully adapted. You knock out a particular gene that is important, no doubt about its importance, and you still find that the system continues as though it didn't matter. But nearly all major functions in the body are like that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be. Full stop. Yes. So you guys have written your manifesto. It's called <laughs> Understanding Living Systems. It encapsulates all of this with lots of stories, lots of illustrations in plain English. And I'm really impressed and I'm honored that you spent some time with me today to tell your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. It's a very great privilege to be joining this podcast. <laughs>